Chapter 4 Fresh, brief showers fell almost every morning now, and between the showers, Quinta and his playmates would dash about excitedly outside. Mine, mine, they would shout at the pretty rainbows that would arc down to the earth, seeming never very far away. But the showers also brought swarms of flying insects whose vicious stinging and biting soon drove the children back indoors. Then, suddenly, late one night, the big rains began, and the people huddled inside their cold huts listening to the water pound on their thatch roofs, watching the lightning flash and comforting their children as the frightening thunder rumbled through the night. Between cloudbursts, they heard only the barking of the jackals, the howling of the hyenas, and the croaking of the frogs. The rains came again the next night, and the next, and the next, and only at night, flooding the lowlands near the river, turning their fields into a swamp and their village into a mud hole. Yet each morning before breakfast, all the farmers struggled through the mud to Jafur's little mosque and implored Allah to send still more rain, for life itself depended upon enough water to soak deeply into the earth before the hot suns arrived which would wither those crops whose roots could not find enough water to survive. In the damp nursery hut, dimly lighted and poorly heated by the burning dry sticks and cattle dung patties in the earthen floor's shallow fire hole, old Nyo Boto told Kunta and the other children of the terrible time she remembered when there were not enough big rains. No matter how bad anything was, Nyo Boto would always remember a time when it was worse. After two days of big rain, she told them, the burning suns had come. Although the people prayed very hard to Allah, and danced the ancestral rain dance, and sacrificed two goats and a bullock every day, still everything growing in the ground began to parch and die. Even the forest's water holes dried up, said Nyoboto, and first wild fowl, and then the forest's animals, sick from thirst, began to appear at the village well. In crystal clear skies each night thousands of bright stars shone, and a cold wind blew, and more and more people grew ill. Clearly, evil spirits were abroad in Jafur. Those who were able continued their prayers and their dances, and finally the last goat and bullock had been sacrificed. It was as if Allah had turned his back on Jafur. Some, the old and the weak and the sick, began to die. Others left town, seeking another village to beg someone who had food to accept them as slaves, just to get something into their bellies, and those who stayed behind lost their spirit and laid down in their huts. It was then, said Nyoboto, that Allah had guided the steps of Marabout Kairaba Kunta Kinti into the starving village of Jafur. Seeing the people's plight, he kneeled down and prayed to Allah, almost without sleep and taking only a few sips of water as nourishment, for the next five days. And on the evening of the fifth day came a great rain, which fell like a flood and saved Jafur. When she finished her story, the other children looked with new respect at Kunta, who bore the name of that distinguished grandfather, husband of Kunta's grandma Yaisa. Even before now, Kunta had seen how the parents of the other children acted toward Yesa, and he had sensed that she was an important woman, just as old Nyo Boto surely was. The big rains continued to fall every night until Kunta and the other children began to see grown-ups wading across the village in mud up to their ankles and even to their knees, and even using canoes to paddle from place to place. Kunta had heard Binta tell Amoro that the rice fields were flooded in the Bolong's high waters. Cold and hungry, the children's fathers sacrificed precious goats and bullocks to Allah almost every day, patched leaking roofs, shored up sagging huts, and prayed that their disappearing stock of rice and couscous would last until the harvest. But Kunta and the others, being yet little children, paid less attention to the hunger pangs in their bellies than to playing in the mud, wrestling each other and sliding on their naked bottoms. Yet in their longing to see the sun again, they would wave up at the slate-colored sky and shout, as they had seen their parents do, 
Shine, son, and I will kill you a goat. The life-giving rain had made every growing thing fresh and luxuriant. Birds sang everywhere. The trees and plants were explosions of fragrant blossoms. The reddish-brown, clinging mud underfoot was newly carpeted each morning, with the bright-colored petals and green leaves beaten loose by the rains of the night before. But amid all the lushness of nature, sickness spread steadily among the people of Jafur, for none of the richly growing crops was ripe enough to eat. The adults and children alike would stare hungrily at the thousands of plump mangoes and monkey apples hanging heavy on the trees. But the green fruits were as hard as rocks, and those who bit into them fell ill and vomited. Nothing but skin and bones, Grandma Yesa would exclaim, making a loud clicking noise with her tongue every time she saw Kunta. But in fact his grandma was almost as thin as he, for every storehouse in Jafur was now completely empty. What few of the village's cattle and goats and chickens had not been eaten or sacrificed had to be kept alive and fed if there was to be a next year's crop of kids and calves and baby chicks. So the people began to eat rodents, roots, and leaves foraged from in and around the village on searchings that began when the sun rose and ended when it set. If the men had gone to the forests to hunt wild game, as they frequently did at other times of the year, they wouldn't have had the strength to drag it back to the village. Tribal taboos forbade the Mandinkas to eat the abounding monkeys and baboons, nor would they touch the many hen's eggs that lay about, or the millions of big green bullfrogs that Mandinkas regarded as poisonous. And as devout Muslims, they would rather have died than eat the flesh of the wild pigs that often came rooting in herds right through the village. For ages, families of cranes had nested in the topmost branches of the village's silk cotton tree, and when the young hatched, the big cranes shuttled back and forth bringing fish, which they had just caught in the bolong, to feed their babies. Watching for the right moment, the grandmothers and the children would rush beneath the tree, whooping and hurling small sticks and stones upward at the nest, and often, in the noise and confusion, the young crane's gaping mouth would miss the fish, and the fish would miss the nest and come slapping down among the tall tree's thick foliage to the ground. The children would struggle over the prize, and someone's family would have a feast for dinner. If one of the stones thrown up by the children happened to hit a gawky, pin-feathered young crane, it would sometimes fall from the high nest along with the fish, killing or injuring itself in the crash against the ground, and that night a few families would have crane soup, but such meals were rare. By the late evening, each family would meet back at their hut, bringing whatever each individual had found, perhaps even a mole or a handful of large grub worms, if they were lucky, for that night's pot of soup, heavily peppered and spiced to improve the taste. But such fare filled their bellies without bringing nourishment, and so it was that the people of Jafur began to die. <laughs>